everybody. I'm seeing a lot of faces and people in the chat. So that's great to see. We have a pretty big group, 70 people. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely. They're excited to get you started. Uh, so I just want to do a quick intro to Jesse. And then, of course, he can, you know, I'm sure he'll do a much better justification to his own intro. Uh, but those of you that have checked him out on LinkedIn, he's currently uh, working at Tesla as an associate software engineer after completing uh, the App Academy program in New York. Uh, before becoming a software engineer, uh, he worked in a handful of high growth startups in a variety of customer facing and operation roles. Um, so over to you, Jesse, all yours. All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know where everybody is, but I imagine people are sprinkled all over the world probably. So um, I'm in San Francisco, so it's still morning for me. So good morning. Uh, cool. So um, just as a starting point, I'm curious uh, what people's um, experiences with Webpack in the past, like how much have you been exposed to it? Have you used it yourself? How much have you struggled with it? Um, I feel like for me, uh, Webpack is sort of like a rite of passage in the front end world where you kind of have to wrestle with it for a while before it starts to make a little bit of sense. So uh, just as a starting point, so I get a better sense of like who's here and what your backgrounds are, would you mind just putting in the chat what sort of experience you've had or exposure you've had with, with Webpack thus far. This will be really helpful for me. Tiny bit, zero, noob, <laughs> heard of it but never used it. First timer, roll up Webpack, create React app does automatically for me. What is Webpack? What's a Webpack? All right, cool. Awesome. So it looks like we're we're on the the less experience with it side of things, which is totally cool. All right. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here as I have a presentation. So you'll see like a repeat of my face for a second, probably. And then let me know when you all see the slides. Are we good with the slides? Beautiful. All right. So as a starting point, there are a gazillion tutorials and videos out there on YouTube and walkthroughs and stuff showing how to like set Webpack up and kind of get started with it. That's not what this is going to be. Instead, this is going to be a little bit more high level, uh, just trying to understand what Webpack is as a starting point and then diving into a very specific piece of that, which is optimizing the performance towards the end. Like once you've kind of built some sort of app how can you actually tweak things with Webpack to make it more performant? Um, so that's going to be kind of the angle of this. Again, there are a million different, very high quality uh, tutorials out there on YouTube or um, many other places as well for how to kind of get Webpack set up uh, for the first time. So I'm going to kind of gloss over that because uh, we don't have a ton of time. Cool. So quick uh, agenda. We'll do, we went a little bit over the last time. so. Uh, or, or the previous speaker went over just a bit. So I don't know uh, what time we're finishing exactly, or if I have a hard cutoff. Can someone tell me? You don't have a hard cutoff. I think we're I good. don't have a hard cutoff. All right, I'll go for hours then. Just keep talking, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, cool. So the idea is for this to be roughly 30 minutes. We're starting about 15 minutes uh, late, but that's OK. So we'll probably end at uh, 45 past the hour. Um, so I'll do a quick intro of me, who I am, my background. Navi gave a, a really brief introduction, but I'll go a little bit more in depth just so you understand my background and kind of my transition into software. Uh, as I imagine many of you are in some sort of transition into the software world as well. I'm going to talk about why Webpack exists. So before we even talk about what it is, why does it, like, who even cares? Like, why, why does it matter? And it's a little bit of background and history there. Then I'm going to talk about what Webpack is and how it uh, addresses the problems um, that were created over time just by the community of, of software. And then we're going to jump into what I call the fun stuff, which is optimizing Webpack. And there I'm going to have a handful of little demos and things that are, are a bit more exciting. Um, and then at the end, we'll have some sort of discussion and Q&A. Uh, if you have questions or thoughts or whatever, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll take a look at that occasionally. It's always valuable for me to get feedback as I'm going through this. So if things are confusing, if I'm going too fast, I'm going too slow or whatever, feel free to just throw your thoughts in the chat and um, that'll be a helpful input for me. Um, cool, so let's get started. So quick intro of me. 
Uh, so I'm a software engineer at Tesla. Um, before that, I worked in a variety of customer success roles. People call this client success sometimes, but it's basically just like customer customer facing roles uh, in different tech companies in New York and Washington, DC. Then I enrolled in App Academy, uh, finished that in March of 2020, which was a pretty tumultuous time to <laughs> jump into the job market with the pandemic hitting everybody. Uh, and below are a handful of logos of organizations that I've worked for or been involved with. Um, you'll see App Academy there as well. And uh, there's a link to my website where I have my contact info, more info about me if you're interested uh, in connecting in any way. I'll, uh, Navi, we can probably share the slides after, right? I'll assume yes. Cool. Um, all right. So jumping right into it, why does Webpack exist? So before the world of JavaScript frameworks, which I imagine some of you may be familiar with, like React and Angular and Vue, there are a handful of others. Uh, typically, in order to execute JavaScript in, in the browser, it would be necessary to include this little script tag, right? And so oftentimes, you would just link to a specific JavaScript file. As JavaScript evolved, and people started playing with it more and more and using it for more and more different things, the amount of these script tags started to increase greatly, right? So this is just an example of three, but imagine if you had 50 different JavaScript files, for example, or JavaScript files that reference other JavaScript files, and then JavaScript files that also reference CSS styling files, right? Imagine you have 50 to 100 of those. All, very, very quickly, it gets challenging to um, import them all in the right order because the order that they're compiled and then linked together basically matters. Otherwise, you're going to get errors or unexpected functionality. And so the, the purpose for Webpack, uh, the reason it came about was to simplify all of this. And instead of manually having to import a bunch of different JavaScript files and then link them to CSS files and manage all of the dependencies. Um, you may be familiar with NPM or node modules, all the dependencies and third party libraries and things like that. It was just a complete mess, basically, and very challenging to do as, as applications got larger and larger. And so the concept of Webpack was introduced in order to automate a lot of that uh, what's called dependency management. Right, so all the different files that are, think about it like a giant octopus, right? All the different octopus arms that are going all over the place. How do you actually uh, use that in a way um, where you don't have to manually figure it out and like troubleshoot all these weird importing, ordering things, especially when you're loading in a browser, there are a lot of different variables that come into play. It's just a, a mess and a nightmare. And so Webpack is designed to solve that by seeking out all the different um, dependencies that you have, which are signified typically by, uh, you may have seen in JavaScript, you can write import or export certain files and certain functions and things. Uh, that's really where Webpack is looking for, is for those, those statements. Um, so that's a very high level. Uh, with every single one of these concepts and slides that I'm talking about, typically I'm gonna put a link here in the top right that goes much more in depth if you're curious with specific examples and videos and stuff. So if I send, when I send this out, uh, the slide deck afterwards, feel free to take a look at these links. I think uh, they'll be helpful for a bit more context. This is just kind of a high level overview. Cool, so then what is Webpack? So this is an image from the Webpack website uh, homepage. And the way that they describe it is bundling your assets, right? Which sounds like kind of confused. What does that even mean, right? And it's basically what I had just discussed, right? So imagine you have 50 plus files, JavaScript files, uh, CSS files. You have all these different uh, third party library dependencies like React, for example, or other things like that. Um, it manages to map all those different dependencies in a graph. And this all happens kind of behind the scenes and then bundles them all together in what they call the bundle of the output file and then spits them out into these, these compressed, usually static files that make it easier for the browser to load. Okay. So this is a Webpack is a huge topic and can get really complicated the deeper you go. There are many layers to it. But this is kind of an overview at a very high level. And if you'd like, I can give a quick demo for those who have not been exposed to Webpack before. 
we're going to just take a quick look. Um, so this is a very simple repository. It's basically the, the Create React app um, repository with a couple additional things, specifically a webpack.config.js file. And this basically tells um, Webpack how to operate, right? I'm not going to get into all the, the specifics here. There's a lot of documentation on this and, and a lot of really good tutorials out there, again, that walk you through kind of the, the first steps of setting this up. And, and there's a lot of um, boilerplate code that you can use. But the basic idea is Webpack starts by looking at a specific file, in this case, index.js, which is typically what, what the naming convention is, as the entry file. And that's where it starts to map out all of the dependencies, right? You can have multiple entry files, which is a bit more advanced. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, and then you have the output, which is that the ultimate file that's generated based on all the dependencies that are found, right? Down here, there's a lot of other additional things. I'm going to skip these two parts for now. Uh, I think they're a bit more intermediate. Uh, and basically, this part here, these modules, what these are used for are uh, when you identify or locate a specific type of file, so in this case, a JS file, this is a regular expression, which is like uh, a way to, to um, search for a really specific type of text. So it's basically saying if the file has .js in the name, meaning it's a JavaScript file, then use a particular type of loader. And what the loader does is it, it scans over that file and uh, modifies the content slightly in a particular way, depending on what that loader is. In this case, we're using a loader called Babel, which is a common, uh, probably the most common loader to use. Um, and basically what it does is it makes that JavaScript um, executable by older browsers also. So it makes like your super advanced uh, cutting edge JavaScript that you just wrote backwards compatible for years without you having to think about anything. So it just makes it easier and more um, universal, universally available. You can do different stuff with CSS, files. Um, there, there are tons of different modules and things that you can do. There's a whole community and ecosystem of these things that you can play with. So I'm not going to get too into them. Just want to focus on the JavaScript one for now. Uh, the same is true with, with plugins. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff here. And there's a whole wild universe of plugins that you can investigate. I'll show you just one that's kind of fun. Um, but that's kind of an overview of the basics of Webpack here as a starting point is um, this is it. This is the Webpack config file. And so what I'm going to do now is run npm run dev. And so what that's going to do, for those of you who are familiar with package JSON files. Um, basically, this just runs a, a particular script that's related to Webpack. So when I'm running npm run and then dev, that dev part is referencing this. So it basically, is just an alias for running this code here. If I were to run this code directly in the, uh, the terminal down here, then it would, um, it would work exactly the same way. And so what this is going to do is start up Webpack in development mode. Basically, that creates like a little local server for me. So I'm going to go ahead and click npm run dev. And I'm just going to warn you that this is a very boring app. <laughs> so it's not going to be very exciting. Uh, don't look at that for a second. We're going to look at localhost 8080. Cool. And here is our Create React app application. Of course, this could be your actual application that you've coded yourself that does cool, fun stuff. But this is kind of the basics. This, what just happened is uh, Webpack looked at our uh, index.js file. Remember, that was our entry file, source slash index.js. So that's this file here. And then started to map out all the different dependencies, React, React DOM, app from app, report web vitals, right? All these different things that are referenced here. It now goes to the next step and looks at React. It looks at React DOM. It looks at the CSS file. It looks at this app file and then creates that dependency. 
Uh, and within those files, it goes and does the same thing again until it gets to the very end of that tree. So within the app.js file, for example, it's going to look again at React. It's going to look at this logo file. It's going to look at app.css. And it bundles all those together and then serves them in a compressed file for you. So that's a very, very quick overview. I imagine if you've never been exposed to Webpack before, you may have some questions. Feel free to, to put any questions in the chat as I go through. I'll, I'll take a look. Um, cool. I'm just going to pause for a second if people have questions, because that might have been overwhelming. So go ahead and post questions in the chat. I'll just hang out. I'm also on a ball, like an exercise ball. So if I appear to be bouncing, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Apologies in advance. All right, I'm not getting any questions. Has everybody understood everything? Which is better, Webpack or Parcel? Uh, I'm actually not super familiar with par Parcel, to be honest with you, but I imagine I would imagine that Webpack probably has a larger following uh, and a larger community, which sometimes is reason enough to use something if the tools are comparable. But um, yeah, I'm not super familiar with Parcel, to be honest with you. Is there, is there common gotchas for Webpack setting up the config? Uh, yeah, I would say just follow boilerplate code. <laughs> as simple as that. Trying to, like the first or second time that you're setting it up, trying to um to create it yourself uh just like looking at the docs and, and typing all the stuff out yourself is almost certainly gonna gonna get messy quickly and confusing so i would suggest when you first start out just copy boilerplate code it doesn't have to have all these like crazy uh you know optimizations and like proxy server stuff going on uh one thing i would mention that can be a bit of a trip up sometimes is um we won't talk very much about this, but this concept of a dev server. So this is what's what creates a local server on my machine through Webpack that allows me to to actually host uh, our app, right? So this can get really um, detailed. You can have a lot of different uh, customizations on this, and that can get a little tricky sometimes when you're then trying to like combine that with. Uh, a backend and API and serve it all through Webpack, that can get a little tricky sometimes. I've definitely struggled with that. Um, a lot of good questions. With Webpack, it, is it essentially used for every project you have or bigger ones that have a thousand files? Uh, pretty much every project I have, um, unless it's really simple. Like for example, my website is just an HTML file pretty much and like one JavaScript file. So in that case, it's not really necessary. But if you're using um, a JavaScript front end framework like React, Vue, or Angular, it, uh, it is almost certainly, um, I don't know if I want to say required, but highly recommended. Um, difference between a loader and a plugin. Uh, I would refer you to the documentation on Webpack. But uh, basically, the idea is um, a loader is applied to a specific type of file. Right, so it could be a CSS file or JS file. And a plugin is like some other random thing that does something. Uh, it could apply to a specific type of file or it could do something completely different. And I'll, I'll show you this bundle analyzer plugin is that you guys saw a quick, quick view of that that I kind of pulled away. Um, what I understand from this Webpack first maps everything within each file with correct order and bundles it. Yes, that is right, Nova. Cool. Uh, Awesome. Thank you for the questions, everybody. I'm going to continue on for now. Um, and we will see some more cool stuff. So now I want to switch over to talking about optimizing Webpack. Um, and when I talk about optimizing, I want to be really specific about what I mean. So keep in mind, you, do, you have zero control over how users load your site, right? It could be on their mobile device. It could be using their 3G uh, data plan that they have. It could be on a desktop. It could be on an iPad. It could be like on a gigantic screen. It could, you know, it could be in many different contexts. 
and internet speeds, device computing power, network transmission stuff, like all of these variables can affect the experience of a user, uh, the, the, the experience that a user would have with your site, right? And so the general idea is that the less a browser has to load, the faster the user experience will generally be. It seems obvious, right? But as you get deeper and deeper into developing and creating all these files, the amount of stuff that you're actually sending to the customer or the user to load in the browser can, can start to get kind of bulky. And then you need to think about, okay, how are we going to reduce this while not compromising uh, the application as it's, as it's been created so far? So the focus on optimizations towards a small bundle.js file is really important. Um, and I just realized that in our example, it was called a main.js file. It's the same concept. It's the file that is output and ultimately loaded in the browser. So just to hop back into the code quickly for a second, um, what is created is this dist folder, which stands for distribution. It's just a naming convention. Don't blame me if it's confusing. <laughs> and what that has is what is ultimately served in the browser or on your local server. So it has uh, an index. Um, it has this, uh, uh, it's a little ugly, but it has an HTML file. And here you'll see that the main.js file is loaded. So there's just that one JavaScript file that's loaded on your HTML file. And then that references this like really ugly looking condensed file that Webpack has created. So this is when I talk about the bundle, when I talk about main.js, bundle.js, I'm referencing this file here, which is uh, the Webpack output basically of all your different JavaScript, CSS, et cetera, files. Cool. And we'll talk about why it looks so crazy in a second. So your goal is to create a small bundle.js file, as small as it can be without compromising the user experience. So you have a couple of what I'm calling intertwined optimization levers. They're all kind of related in one way or another, but they're kind of different stages or themes uh, that I, I thought it made sense to think about these in. So the first is the build time. So how long does it take for you to build the Webpack bundle and output? You may have noticed that when I ran that Webpack code, it kind of took a second, like five, maybe 10 seconds to actually output something. The more complicated your code gets, that can get uh, very long. It could be two minutes in some cases, right? Imagine doing uh, developing locally and every time you make a change in order to see it, it takes two minutes. That would be really unfortunate and you know, kind of hard to, to develop quickly and really frustrating. So that's what I mean when I talk about build time how long it takes for Webpack to generate that output. We'll talk about a couple strategies there. Uh, we'll talk about just creating the smallest bundle you can and how to keep that in mind as you're um, developing. And then the final piece is what I'm calling browser loading techniques. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the case that the browser loads all of the file at once. You can kind of split it out strategically some people call this lazy loading or code splitting. So we'll talk about that a bit more as well. Cool, we're doing pretty good on time, about halfway done. Sweet. So I'm going to talk about these in reverse. So I'm gonna start with browser loading techniques and then go to these and then these, because you have a bit more control, I think. And it's like a bit more obvious and visible what's happening with the build time, whereas browser loading techniques can get a little out there. It's more removed from you as the developer. Uh, Cool. So browser load techniques. So we're going to talk about this, uh, this concept of code splitting. And some people call this lazy loading, which you, you may have heard of before. The basic concept is that the browser only loads particular sections of codes when they're needed, instead of loading the entire bundle JS file up front at the beginning. Right? So imagine you have like a giant site that has an e-commerce section. 
right? But the e-commerce section is maybe only used by 10% of the users. You don't want to necessarily load the e-commerce section for all users if it's going to be a really JavaScript heavy uh, section. Um, so in that case, you can what, what's called code split, right? And so you strategically um, using Webpack or actually you can do this with React and, and other uh, frameworks as well, uh, only have it load in the browser if the user actually goes to that section. So this is just a comparison here. Uh, this is not my image. This is an image I found online of the before and after experience for your initial load of a page after doing some code splitting. You can see that it basically halved it almost, not quite, but it reduced it significantly uh, to a point where every little piece of optimization where you can get a faster load is going to improve the user's experience because nobody likes a slow website, right? And uh, there's this tool from, from Google called Lighthouse that can be used to, to um, generate this type of information for a particular website. So that's code splitting. Uh, moving on, we'll talk about optimizing the bundle size, right? So remember, we were just looking at the, the bundle.js file and it looked like completely crazy and all over the place and completely unreadable. That's because what happens typically, uh, um, and you can do this in different ways, but it's uh, what people call uglified or minified. And so basically what that does is you have some sort of input, in this case, it's our JavaScript file or files, and it gives you some sort of output that's wildly condensed. So it, move, it, it removes any white space, it removes um, other stuff, it changes thing, the content slightly to be more optimized for space because a computer doesn't care if there's spaces or not. That's for humans, right? A computer just cares that there's no syntactical errors or whatever, as long as it can uh, execute as expected. So this is what is loaded in the browser ultimately is uh, this uglified or minified code. And in our uh, Webpack configuration that I was showing a moment ago, there's um, this very popular uh, plugin called Uglify JS plugin, which does exactly that. And so that's why um, the browser uh, loads a file that looks kind of like this sometimes with Webpack is it condenses it significantly. And that saves some space. And you can see an example here of just how much space was saved. Almost half, right? So you can basically half what's going on. I have a question. Is minifying and uglifying the same as gzipping? Uh, they are similar. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know like the, the deep details of gzipping, but I know it's, it's similar. And we'll, we'll at least touch on gzipping for a second um, before, but they're related. Yes, uh, and I have some links up here at the top to both this, this little demo that you can play with with your own JavaScript code to see what those output numbers end up being. And then also this uh, Uglify JS plugin uh, that you can use, which is extremely common. I see this often. Cool, moving on, uh, talking about the bundle size, we're gonna talk about tree shaking, which was actually a new concept for me until very recently when I was uh, starting to put together this presentation. Um, and the idea here is that you don't load everything from a third party, um, uh, from another file. It could be a third party library like React, or it could be some uh, file of your own with various functions, right? So, the difference here, I don't know how, how many of you are familiar with the, the concept of destructuring, but it's just like pulling out specific functions or um, variables from a file instead of all of them. So the difference here is that this is importing basically the entire file versus this is importing just these three variables or functions. And surprisingly, this can have an enormous effect on how large your bundle is. Uh, so just keep an eye out for not necessarily always importing everything, especially from third party libraries, which can get really bulky and instead import only the parts of it that you really need. And then within Webpack, there are different ways that you can uh, enable tree shaking. So I'm just going to read this out because this quote from this Google developer guide is very clear and really helpful. Highly recommend reading this guide to tree shaking if you'd like. Uh, the difference between the second import example, which is down here at the bottom right, and the previous one is that rather than importing everything from the array utils module, which could be a lot of stuff, 
This example imports only specific parts of it. In dev builds, this doesn't really change anything as the entire module gets imported regardless. In production builds, however, we can configure Webpack to quote, shake off exports from ES6 modules that weren't explicitly imported, making those production builds smaller. So it's just being more specific in what you're importing and then uh, enabling some tree shaking configuration within Webpack to identify that for production builds specifically. Cool, moving on. So now we're shifting over to the build itself instead of uh, the bundle size. Again, they're kind of related and overlapping. Um, so it's also possible to not just have a single Webpack file necessarily, but you can have multiple Webpack files that, um, that differ slightly for different situations. So the most common situation that I've seen is you have kind of a, a general, what's called common, webpack.common.js. And so that is um, common Webpack structure that you have for any situation, right? For example, you might have that, that Babel um, uh, loader being used. Um, but you might have a slightly different situation if you're developing locally versus preparing this for a production environment, right? You're actually releasing this into the wild for real users. So in a Webpack dev situation, maybe you just want to enable that, that Webpack dev server that we touched on very briefly uh, versus in prod, you want to do some additional things that might take longer to build, but are ultimately more optimized in the browser for the user, right? So there's like kind of a trade off here of at what point you want to optimize certain things. Uh, for developing locally, you don't really care hugely about how long it takes to load in the browser. Like one, you know, 0.5 seconds of difference is going to make or break your experience locally. But uh, having a load time of like two minutes locally would be extremely cumbersome, right? So you want to try to reduce that local build time uh, for yourself so that every change you make, it doesn't take two minutes to actually see it updated in the, the browser as you're developing. And I want to show a real life example of this. Uh, so this is something that I was working on um, where I was frustrated by this very issue where the um, the build time was almost a minute for every single time I made a change, right? So imagine you change one character and then it hot reloads and it takes an entire minute to update. It's really, it's, it's like impossible to work like that, right? It's so frustrating and annoying. Um, and so what I figured out is by using this, um, this Webpack plugin called Speed Measure, I was able to see what specifically was taking so long, right? You can see very quickly, there's an outlier here that makes a big difference, which was this Terser plugin. And so what I did was I split the production Webpack uh, and, and the development Webpack uh, into two separate files. And then with the development Webpack, I didn't actually need the Terser plugin. That was only a production specific thing. Um, and so suddenly I was able to update the Webpack uh, build within you know, 10 seconds or so. So that's a massive difference and a huge change for your own personal experience developing if you're able to make that sort of change. So that's a, a real life example of this production versus development Webpack file um, concept. There's also a very helpful Webpack plugin generally. Um, cool, and this is actually the first of several slides that I want to talk about monitoring and analyzing some of this, uh, like build time and size of files. Like, the, it, it's a little confusing at first. Like, where do you even start approaching that? Do you start at the browser? Do you start locally? Uh -huh. um, so this is one plugin that will give you some visibility into that. Again, made a huge difference for me. This is just the local build. Um, Something else that's really valuable is uh, that I discovered somewhat recently is this um, VS Code. I hope uh, some of you use VS Code um, uh, extension called Import Cost, and basically the idea is it shows you how much it it, it costs in quotes uh, for you to load a particular module, right? So React, React DOM, two examples here. You can see that React DOM is way bigger than React, right? And so that could maybe be a challenge at some point. Uh, if you have many, many modules like this, 
as you're coding, before you even get to any sort of build stage or testing or whatever, you can see right away what the size is. So you can kind of catch it early and just have an awareness of that as you're building things. Um, and related to that, perhaps it would be valuable to use that concept of tree shaking that we were talking before. Uh, I got a question from Richard about this. So you have to know what's going to be shaken off of the tree before you can destructure it. Uh, I think so. So like if you were looking for a specific, let's say you have some sort of library X, you only want to use the function uh, hello world within that library X, it would make sense to only import and destructure that one hello world function instead of importing the whole thing, right? And that might end up adjusting what you're ultimately importing. And you can see here gzipped. Um, I think Webpack, I, I'm not super familiar with Gzip, the concept there, to be honest with you, but if you Google around, I'm sure you can learn more. Cool. So that is two ways to kind of monitor and analyze uh, Webpack build times and file sizes and module sizes and stuff like that. Uh, the final one, which is a bit more exciting, is uh, a bit more interactive. And so this is another plugin that you can use that I think I might already have loaded. Yes. Um, so within our Webpack uh, config file here, one of these plugins that I've mentioned really briefly once or twice is this bundle analyzer plugin, right? And so what this allows us to do is it opens up this little local server thing um, which shows us all the modules that we're importing and what their size is uh, visually, right? So it becomes really obvious quickly what is taking up so much space in our bundle. Guess what? It's this one here, <laughs> React DOM development, which also coincides with what we were seeing a second ago uh, right here, right? So you start to see patterns and you start to identify where files are large, where modules are large, where you can maybe cut down on things, where you can optimize, where you can shake the tree, so to speak, right? Um, so my my version of this locally on my computer is pretty unexciting because uh, it's just like out of the box React um, versus this example that I found online. Um, you can see it's much more detailed. There's a lot going on here. When you have a large application, it can be hard to kind of sift through it all you can see very quickly, okay, what is taking so much space? Oh, okay, that helps you prioritize. Maybe I can destructure and, and tree shake some of those blooper.js files, for example, uh, to optimize your build a bit. Or maybe you can eliminate them altogether somehow by, by creating some of your own code or simplifying it in some way. Um, yeah, as some final thoughts here as we wrap up, I think uh, the value in these monitoring strategies is just having an awareness of Webpack and how it works is that you can layer these strategies into your workflow. So you don't start creating something, you have this awesome app, really excited about it, but it takes two seconds to load in the browser. Ugh, now you're gonna have to change some things, right? Instead, you incorporate this mindset from the very beginning. So you can see what the sizes of different things are as you're importing. As you're building locally, you can adjust things as needed. Um, you can kind of separate development and production. You can shake the trees. Right? You can do all these things as you're creating things and have an awareness so it doesn't, it doesn't become like extra work at the end that you need to do, but instead um, it, it's integrated into your workflow. It's work that you're already naturally doing and thinking about. So that's my case for optimizing with Webpack. Um, I think that's just about it. Uh, so yeah, can move on to kind of discussion Q&A briefly. Um, I just want to say I'm not like a master at Webpack. It is a huge topic with a giant ecosystem, so many different plugins. There's tons to explore and see. So check out the Webpack documentation. Um, a handful of other topics that if people have questions about or curious about, I can talk about if needed, but I'll kind of end there. Hey, Jesse, how are we doing on time? How much time do you have for Q&A? Uh, I could probably do five to 10 minutes. OK, cool. All right. In the case of your React on file, what would 
what uh, would that be a file that you'd be able to tree shape from without breaking your code? Um, possibly, yeah. I think um, you never know until you try it, right? I think it's worth experimenting with. If you're only using a particular function, like um, React DOM, for example, there's a function render, which would render a specific React component on um, the, the React DOM. Uh, I know in some cases I use that. That's the only part of React DOM that I'm using. So uh, that could definitely be a good candidate for restructuring. But I think that's more broadly applicable to any library. Next question, uh, is there an automatic destructurer? Um, I'm not sure what that would mean because I think in order to, like you need to know what you want to import. So there, there can't be an automated step for that. Um, unless, do you mean like, it only like you you import the whole library, then you change some things in your code, and you use particular parts of that library, and then you click like automate destructuring, <laughs> and it only imports the the particular files that you need or, or functions that you need. Uh, that might exist. Um, Google around, you might find something. I wouldn't be surprised. That sounds helpful. Uh, as a front end dev in a large project, how often do you tweak the Webpack config file? Um, I would say it definitely happens more on the initial part of the project as you're just setting things up and kind of, you know, getting your environment set up, then ultimately pushing to production. I don't think there's a ton of changes that happen after that necessarily, unless you're wanting to focus on optimizations like we just talked about, right? So you can add different plugins, you can tweak things. Um, you can, you can really customize Webpack a lot, uh, but you know, Simplicity is usually the way to go. Um, a lot of questions. React DOM functions usually use switch and link, which can be structured out React DOM. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so identify what you need a lot. Uh, if you import an entire library in one file and only some functions library in another within the same project, would it make a difference on the bundle size? you import an entire library in one file and only some functions library in another within the same project, would it make a difference in the bundle size? Um, probably. Uh, I would say this is where the analyzing and, and looking at the data comes into play, right? You can, you can experiment with yourself and use some of the, the plugins and stuff that I mentioned. Um, there's definitely not a one size fits all uh, approach here. It's more like some general concepts and guidelines to follow and measure yourself. Uh, and one of the slides you have a dev pack. What is the benefit of doing an intermediate dev pack as opposed to just doing a production web pack when everything is ready to deploy? Um, so let's go back to that slide. Uh, I think you're referring to this one. Um, the value there is uh, in some cases you might want some specific configurations for production. Like again, we mentioned the browser loading um, optimizations and code splitting, which isn't as relevant locally. Um, that could be one example of why you would want a production build uh, that's slightly different and separate. Um, you think using a webpack on a single page app is an overkill? Uh, it can be. It's. It, it, I feel like it's sort of become the de facto standard that people kind of expect. Um, that doesn't mean it's a good idea, of course, necessarily. Uh, um, when you say a single page app, you mean like a React app, right? Not a, a literal single page application, like one index.html file and like maybe one JavaScript file or something. Or you, you mean, yes, React app. Um, no, I don't think it's overkill. It's it's very common, uh, but you know, there's always the question of tooling. Like, what are you trying to accomplish? Um, if you're trying to accomplish a really uh, sophisticated React app, then yeah, it probably makes sense. If you want to do like a personal blog that is just one page long and a bunch of plain text, then maybe not as much. And in fact, then you might be over engineering. It might just make sense. Like again, I'll bring up the the example of my personal website. It's just an HTML file and one JavaScript file, no React. Uh, is Webpack built over node.js? Um, there are a lot of, uh, I'm not sure exactly what that question is asking, but it is, they're very much related. Um, uh, 
That's a good question. I'm not sure the exact relationship between the two, but um, they're certainly very compatible with each other. A lot of tools out there that will like make them play nice. Uh, I think React needs to compile stuff to become JavaScript that the browser needs. The browser can't read raw React. Uh, that's true, yes. But I, I would question the premise of using React in the first place. That's what I was kind of getting at is um, for really simple websites, sometimes you don't need React, but it's it feels safe. It feels like the, the kind of knee jerk reaction sometimes for developers, including me, frankly. So um, sometimes just HTML and CSS is enough. Maybe one JavaScript file. If you have one vanilla JavaScript file, hmm, what pack you probably don't need. Um, cool, any more questions? Feel free to keep them coming. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Awesome. I was wondering if, if, if uh, that was going to work. So I'm looking over the Babel loader, and I, yes. I noticed that it, it was specific to JavaScript. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to installing Webpack, do you have to individually install all these loaders along with it? Or when you when you install Webpack, does it download all that for you and have it in the in the JS file for Webpack? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm going to start by just giving a very quick overview of what Babel is for, for people that might not be familiar with it. So uh, <laughs> as it says here, this is the Babel website. Babel is a JavaScript compiler. What does that mean? That means it makes it backwards compatible, right? Uh oh, I think I just ruined the automated stuff. Yeah, so um, for example, this const city equals address.city, it spits it out, Babel transforms it. So this is like the Webpack Babel step right here. It transforms it into this output, which is compatible with uh, older technologies and browsers. Um, so your question was, is it necessary? Like, is it built in? What, what was the exact question again, sir? Yeah, sorry, it was kind of a very in-depth question. Uh, when, you're, when you're installing Webpack, uh, if in the config.js, does it automatically download the, the Babel loader and the, the style loader for like CSS and all that? Or do you have to individually download each of those loaders along with it? Because Yeah, that's like a great question. Um, let's go to our package.json file and let's search for Babel and see what we find. So there are a couple dependencies here that I downloaded explicitly using NPM, right? So there's Babel core, Babel, whatever. Babel preset M, Babel preset React. I'm sure there are other things uh, that you can do with Babel or other compilers. Um, so you do, in this case, need to download those explicitly um, separately. So it's not like automatically imported. Okay. Um, yeah. And, all and the, same, the same is true for plugins. However, okay, I was just going to ask. Yeah. So all those things <laughs> were individually downloaded. OK, cool. What's interesting here, which you may have noticed, is that the plugins you have to um, uh, declare explicitly versus okay. here, like use uh, Babel loader. Um, this starts to get a little messy and like in the weeds, but there's also this thing called a Babel RC file where I believe uh, Webpack will look when you enable Babel. It looks at this file for specific Babel specific configuration. So this is sort of like importing Babel to some extent. That's pretty complicated, but pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, highly recommend looking at online tutorials. Thank you. Yep. Uh, tree shaking in particular, even if your bundler supports it, only works for libraries published as ES6 models. React isn't from Dan Abramov's Twitter. Uh, yeah, that could be the case. I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not an expert here. And there's, there's a lot of these concepts that are evolve very quickly and might depend on different technologies. Um, so when in doubt, Google around, do your own research. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that's correct. Uh, cool, I think questions have slowed. Maybe I could take one more question verbally if someone wants it. Going once. Like twice. Okay, I'll go for it. <laughs> oh, barely. Okay, what's up? Um, yeah, so in some projects, I've tried to have everything in my source folder go through Webpack. So I know with React, for example, sometimes like the index.html 
and like your assets and manifest and things like that will just go right into the public and then everything else will be bundled in there. Is there an advantage to having like everything in your source in your sor source folder? Um, because for me, I, I just thought, okay, it's pretty cool that I can just build and then everything in the public is, you know, built in that step and I can completely delete the public folder and have it, you know, rebuilt again. Does that really make a difference in an actual, um, you know, on the job? Uh, let me repeat your question back to you. So I know that I understand it and for other people as well. Um, so you're talking about this folder here, the public folder where you have your index.html file, manifest, your favorite con perhaps, yeah. um, versus the source file here. And you're saying that what exactly? That Webpack compiles those and, and spits them out here? And, and like, what's the advantage to that? Or what, what's the right, exact right, question? Right. Yeah. So like, for example, rather than having the favicon and index.html and all that in the public folder, mm -hmm. um, having them in the source folder and having those be built by Webpack as well. So like everything comes from the source folder. Um, yeah. So this, that's a very good question. Um, this is where this particular plugin comes into play, this HTML Webpack plugin. Um, basically what this does is it, it takes that index.html file in the public folder and then spits it out after some transformations into this distribution folder, right? So this is ultimately the only thing that's shared in the browser, right? Is this distribution folder theoretically. Um, so this index.html is the same as this, except that it now is pointing towards um, main.js instead of some other stuff potentially. And like, it might have some other changes, like it might have the favicon included in here, right? Um, I don't know if that really answers your question at all, uh, but there are different plugins and things that that can take either from a public folder. I, I suppose it could be in the source folder. I'm not sure if it matters ultimately. It might just be that Webpack defaults looking in the public folder, but you might be able to customize that. Um, I would Google around some some your question. You might find some more in depth guides and answers and stuff. But that's like sort of touching on it a little bit. That was helpful. Okay, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, it was a pleasure being with you all today. I got to go in a moment, uh, but I just want to uh, just say one more time, if you want to get in touch or learn more about me or whatever, uh, my website will be linked on one of those first uh, slides in the deck. Uh, so feel free to take a look at that and see my contact information and GitHub, LinkedIn, et cetera. Something. Awesome. Jesse, can I drop your LinkedIn profile in the chat so that everyone can connect with you? Yeah, sure. Okay. And if you have any feedback on this, was it helpful? Was it not helpful? That's really valuable to me. So I, I appreciate if you shared that. Um, constructive criticism is always the best. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for being so generous and answering all the questions. That was very, very, very kind of you and uh, for sticking around. I know the session was only booked for 30 minutes. So that was really nice of you. Really, really appreciate it. Super helpful and informative. Um, thank you everyone for attending. I'm also dropping my LinkedIn profile. You can connect with me there. And thank you for joining us on another Friday. Jesse, thanks again. And uh, see you guys again. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye everybody.